Welcome to part four of the podcast lecture on nanophotonic. This will tell about optical tweezers, near field optics, and photonic crystals. This is the original outline of the lecture podcast. We have come to the framed part. I will change the original order and start with optical tweezers. So what might that be, optical tweezers? We know what regular tweezers are. So what do we use tweezers for, Siri? Napping my eyebrows. Well, you perhaps could do that optically by using lasers too. But I wanted to emphasize the generalized functions of a tweezer that is also used by an optical tweezer. We use irregular tweezers to grab objects, here a mosquito, and to move them. That is the function we will replicate with optical tweezers. We are able to move objects with a laser because the photon has momentum. It is h bar times k. Same as photon energy over speed of light. So we can push objects. How can we grab at it? thing with a laser. Momentum enough. Let's do some simple calculations. We consider the ideal situation sketched in the figure. A sphere of SiO2 is balancing on a very narrow laser beam. SiO2, that's silica or quartz. We want to calculate the intensity of the laser beam needed for levitating the particle in free space counteracting the gravity. We assume the laser beam is so narrow that all photons hit the nanoparticle at its lowest point. We assume the SiO2 particle is transparent with no absorption. We calculate how much of the laser beam is reflected when going from the air to the sphere. We can calculate that from the refractive index of air and SiO2. From this simple expression for normal incidence, R equals the difference of the refractive indexes over the sum of the refractive indexes squared, which you may just look up. Setting in numbers, I get a value of 0 0.027. When considering single photons, we consider the reflectivity as a probability for reflection. So out of 1,000 photons, 27 of them are likely to be reflective. We ignore multiple reflections for simplicity. I then only consider the rays drawn in the figure. Photon coming in, this has a probability of being reflected and a probability of being transmitted. It is the reflection that results in a force that will push the sphere upwards. I only need to calculate for vertical coordinates here and choose positive direction upward. I calculate the change in one photon's momentum, delta P1. It is equal to the momentum after hitting the sphere minus the momentum before hitting the sphere. The momentum before hitting the sphere is h bar k. So in the expression for delta Pn, at the bottom, h bar k goes outside the parenthesis. And the minus 1 in the parenthesis is the momentum before hitting the sphere. The momentum after hitting the sphere is the superposition of the photon being reflected. Its probable momentum is minus r times h bar k because it is in the negative direction and the superposition of the photon not being reflected, which is uh, 1 minus r times h bar k. We write down the results for delta p1 here. Thus the gravitational force minus mg equals the change of momentum of the photons per time unit, delta p over delta t which is the number of photons per time, I sub p, multiplied by the momentum change of one photon with the sphere. 
which was delta P1. Then the number of photons per time unit is minus mg divided by delta P1. We set in for delta P1 the momentum change for one photon, which was 2 h bar kr. We set in that uh, k equals 2 pi over lambda, the wavelength, and uh, we have an expression we can calculate. We have the mass density and calculate the volume from the radius of the sphere. I get 10 to 14 photons per second. We can calculate the power of the laser. The power is energy per time unit. And we know the energy of the photon from its wavelength. I get then a 53 microwatt, which is not all that much. So we should be able to push that sphere sufficiently with a normal laser. But if the photon beam is just a point, then is this a stable situation? If we now have a beam labeled 2 that is off-center, which way will it push the sphere, left or right? You can think about that yourself for a short time. We can trace the rays for beam 2. It will be refracted when hitting the sphere, so it will bend to the left. The momentum will have a horizontal component when leaving the sphere. The photon still has a horizontal component to the left. In the interaction of the photon with the sphere, the momentum has to be conserved. That means the sphere is given a component in the right direction. So, when hitting the sphere to the right of the center, it is moved further to the right. From that, we can deduce that in a beam with an intensity profile, the sphere will be steered to where the intensity is highest. But what about the vertical position? Do we have to adjust the intensity very precisely? Then we would have to know the weight accurately before grabbing the object, otherwise it would blow away and up, or it will fall down. Luckily, there is a mechanism that will help to keep the sphere near the focal point or the focus of the laser beam. It is sketched here in the right half of the figure where the laser beam is assumed to be focused by a microscope objective. And you can trace the ratio cell and see that the resulting force will be toward where the intensity is highest for dielectric particles. These characteristics can also be derived directly from Maxwell equations, and we should not need to assume that the wavelength of light is larger than the size of the particle. One then arrives at the general result that the force goes with the gradient of the square of the electrical field, or the gradient in the intensity. The figure shows two Nobel Prize winners that have used optical lasers at Bell Labs to hold objects. Arthur Ashkin invented the optical twister. Stephen Chu used laser to trap atoms and cool them down in the crossing of six lasers. Here is seen popular things to do with optical tweezers. People have functionalized the surface to attach molecules, which again attached to DNA chains. Then they have stretched these DNA molecules. Same thing, just showing the humans behind the stretching of the DNA too and how different popular science artists visualize it. Then I'll talk about near-field microscopy. 
are mentioned and motivated by diffraction limit in normal microscopy. Then there is something called near-field light. What is it? It is exploited in near-field optical microscopy. Tell how that can be done, particularly in techniques called SNOM, scanning near-field optical microscopy. In an optical microscope, you can get different magnifications by changing objectives and lenses. However, there is a limit to how large magnification will do you any good. Going beyond the limit will give you too much blur. You could think that it was a matter of how well and precisely one shaped these objectives. That is important, but there is a fundamental limit for a normal optical microscopy. It was first formulated as Abbas criterion. Smallest distance you could see is D in the formula. It does depend upon the wavelength of the light. So violet light gives the best resolution. It also depends upon the numerical aperture defined by the opening angle. You can never make sinus larger than one in the formula, but there are practical limitations before that. Uh, with violet light, the best one can do is 200 nanometer. The ABBA criterion is due to diffraction, but perhaps easier also due to diffraction to understand by the Rayleigh criterion. Look at the figure to the right. Say we are observing a small hole in a metal film with light from below. The intensity at the focal point will not be a point, but a circle with concentric rings around it. The intensity is shown by the 2D and 3D curves to the right. Notice the intensity goes to zero at a distance that depends upon the wavelength and the numerical aperture. In order to resolve the existence of two small holes in the metal film, they have to be further apart than this distance shown as the limiting case by the red and green curves on the left. The ABBA and the Rayleigh criterion is just 20% different. Notice that one has diffraction limit to feature sizes uh, obtained by lithography too. One has moved to shorter and shorter wavelengths to improve the resolution. One can also actually beat this Rayleigh and Ab criterion by a factor of two by manipulating the face of the light. But that's a different story. Here we consider exploration of near field light. We consider in the figure a surface with some features with some separation. When we detect the electromagnetic waves far away from the surface, the smallest feature we can observe on the surface is limited by the diffraction limit. So if we, as on the right hand figure, have a feature with smaller size than that allowed by the diffraction limit, we won't detect how small it is. No matter if we use our eyes or another method for uh, detecting the electromagnetic radiation. However, if our detection of the electromagnetic uh, wave is done close to the surface, we will be able to observe the small feature. The figure shows electromagnetic wave fronts from the surface. The near field is the electromagnetic radiation close to the surface. Cool. But how should we do it? Do you have any suggestions, Siri? How about gluing the feature on a contact lens? That's an interesting idea. Here I show how they have exploited the near field light in scanning near field optical microscopy. One is leading the light to a tip operated as an AFM tip. It is led there through an optical fiber. Look at the figure to the right, showing the field close to the tip. We have the near field very close to the tip. 
So we actually have a small distance where the light is going straight out of the fiber, not immediately fanning out, which is in our favor. We can use the tip to collect photons from the surface, or as shown in the figure to the left, one has used different approaches. Exciting by the tip, or sending light from the tip and observing the reflection by the tip, shining light everywhere and pick up light by the fiber tip, and so on. The image of polystyrene spheres at the bottom demonstrate a resolution that is better than optical microscopy. For the sharpest figure, the tip is at a distance of 10 nanometers, according to the announcement, and the resolution is better than 50 nanometer with wavelength of 1000 nanometer, where normal optical microscopy would have a resolution limit of 500 nanometer. The bottom figure shows electromagnetic field above a chain of metal nanospheres. You see that the optical field is a maximum at the ends just like an antenna. So there may be plasmonic interaction between the metal nanoparticles. The figure to the top is not as known, but illustrates picking evanescent uh, electromagnetic field by metal nanowires. The evanescent field travels along the surface. Then I will talk a little bit about photonic crystals. Photonic crystals act upon photons as normal crystals act upon electrons in the material. The electrons we have in a material have wavelengths that are very different from the wavelengths of light. Therefore, photonic crystals have periodicity lengths describing the size of repeating motifs that are very different from the lattice constant of regular crystals. The periodicity of crystals and photonic crystals will result in bands and band gaps where there are no energy states. For photonic crystals, it means that certain wavelengths may not be allowed in the photonic crystal. One can build up this photonic crystal artificially. While nature have examples where the colors are due to photonic crystals, examples are the bright colors we see in the butterfly wings, and also the colors of peacocks, natural opals used in jewelry are another example. So you see in the figures that there are periodic uh, or quasi-periodic uh, structures associated with it. Here are some examples of man-made photonic crystals. They all show periodic structures with some intentional defects to that periodicity. That means they will be localized states in the photonic crystals, photonic crystal defects. To the left, there are examples where periodic patterns in the holes in the films have been made, with some places without holes. So it is a 2D photonic crystal. The electromagnetic intensity will be very different and strong around those defects in the, this case. To the right are 2D crystals made in optical fibers. I'll just give an example of a thesis on photonic crystals. To make you aware of opportunities for research, it was supervised by Olaf Solgård at Stanford University and Osman Sudbe at the University of Oslo. Sudbe has a course on photonic crystals. The student did the work at Stanford and Mina Lab in Oslo while he was a student at NTNU. He's now working in a company in Oslo and working on photonic crystals. Here is a 2D photonic crystal made in a sandwich of silicon nitride and silicon oxide. This is the photonic crystal he made. The motivation was to detect nanostructures, for example, viruses. This was before the COVID-19. This shows a simulation of light intensity around holes in the membrane. It shows an increased electromagnetic field at the edges of holes. 
that can be exploited for increased sensitivity for detection in spectroscopy. Mm -hmm.